Good morning, my name is Hannah Horiuchi and I am a senior political science and international relations major here at Carleton. And it is my pleasure to introduce today's convocation speaker, Matthew earned his PhD in political science from the University of Massachusetts and his BA by Beta Kappa at the University of Pennsylvania where he was a Benjamin scholar, a Benjamin Franklin scholar. Before the 2016 primaries, when most people did not consider Donald Trump a serious political player, Matthew's studies showed differently. He warned Americans that Donald Trump's activation of authoritarians would make not just his candidacy, but uh, not just his candidacy as the Republican nominee in the, pres in the primaries unstoppable, but his victory in the 2016 presidential election almost certain. Since those initial studies, McWilliams has launched surveys and qualitative research exploring the global rise of authoritarianism and discussed the implications of his findings for the future of democracy with elected officials and civil society leaders across the United States, Europe, and Eurasia. His articles on Trump in Politico, the London School of Economics blog, and Vox have sparked international media debates that have contributed to the framing of Trump and his tactics as authoritarian. His work has been reprinted or referenced by leading media around the world, including The Washington Post, NPR, The Atlantic, CNN, um, and MSNBC, to name a few. In 2020, he published his book, On Fascism, 12 Lessons from American History, detailing the authoritarian strain that runs through American history. Matthew's talk is particularly timely here at Carleton because the overarching theme of our political science department this year has been democracy and autocracy. We've hosted panels and events centered around this topic and even put out the inaugural edition of our student-run political science publication with the theme, Autocracy and Democracy. I am particularly interested in hearing what Matthew has to say because I've spent the years studying and collecting data on authoritarian populists. So without further ado, I'd like you all to join me in welcoming Matthew McWilliams to Carleton College Convocation. <laughs> Thank you so much for the wonderful welcome. Uh, and thank you all for, for clapping. That's always so uh, heartwarming to hear. I appreciate it very much. Sometimes when I get up, people don't applaud. They do. Uh, you know, the sun is out. It's warm, very somewhat warm here. Not as warm as where I just came from. And it's opening day in Baltimore right now, uh, where I came from yesterday, where it was 87 degrees. Now, my typical presentation is about the length of a, one of those new pitch count baseball games. Uh, about three hours, give or take. Uh, and I, I am sure that's your worst nightmare of a, a Fidel Castro Carlton convo speaker would be your worst nightmare. But at least you could say you survived. So I've been told, thank you, Noel, uh, gently but firmly to behave. Uh, so I will be brief and pitch just one inning today. That's all we're going to pitch. So good morning again. And I'm going to start with a story. Uh, there's a story about my mentor, Ben Franklin. Here we are together at Penn. And the Constitutional Convention in Philadelphia at what we call today Independence Hall. On the last day of the convention, with the Constitution signed, sealed, and delivered, Franklin was asked, as he left the hall, Mr. Franklin, Franklin, what type of government have you given us? His answer was classic Franklin, a pithy, a republic if you can keep it. A republic if you can keep it is as apt a question today as it was in that fine fall day 200 years ago in Philadelphia. Can we keep our democratic republic? Many of the founders, really thoughtful students of history were doubtful. John Quincy Adams, captured this skepticism, writing, democracy, democracy never lasts long. It soon wastes, exhausts, and murders itself. There never was a democracy yet that did not commit suicide. What a fun guy, John Quincy Adams, right? What a fun guy, did not commit suicide. Uh, so is our democracy living up to Adam's prediction today? Are we on a suicide watch? Can we keep our republic? Well, the recent history you all know, and all know too well. You know, from the insurrection on January 6th, 
to the legitimization of violence as a form of political speech. The Republican Party declaring that the January 6th attack on the Capitol was legitimate political discourse? Really? Sacking the Capitol? Chanting, hang Mike Pence, hunting members of Congress? That is now considered legitimate political discourse? It was legitimate political discourse in Ukraine before the Maidan Revolution in 2014, but I, I, my mom didn't tell me that was a political, legitimate uh, discourse. And to calls by political elites for a red state, blue state divorce. We need to separate by red and blue states and shrink the size of the federal government, says Margaret Taylor Greene. A Confederate idea if there ever were one, right? But wait, there's more. A little othering and name calling to round out the argument. From the sick and disgusting woke culture issues shoved down our throats, the Democrats' traitorous America last policies, we are done. Done with what? Done with the Union, the United States of America? I think people who say that are violating at least Section 3 of Article of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution. And, you know, everyone I talk to, everyone she talked to says so, oh my God, who on God's green earth does she talk to? These are numerous examples. There are others out there. There were two just in the news this morning. They raise the stakes and concerns about the future of our republic. These events feel like large red flags, and they are. Yet these events are mere symptoms of a larger, more systemic challenge confronting our republic. And that's what I want to focus on today. I'm so glad the political science department's focused on democracy. Woohoo, yes. Uh, that challenge is the fundamental attitudes of Americans towards democracy on one side and authoritarianism on the other. The public's attitudes towards democracy and its institutions and the activation of authoritarianism, which we'll be seeing going on here, make this a different and more dangerous time in our nation that we face since the Civil War, and I think we're all feeling it. But that's my hypothesis right now. I want to give you some data that shows that this is true. And that's a pretty big claim, right? So what's my evidence? Well, let's consider three pieces of evidence today in this 30-minute, not Fidel Castro long speech. And let's look at them one by one, and let's start with a short poll. This is going to uh, require you to take action from your seats. What's that for short? What's this poll? This poll has four simple yes or no questions, and here's how you take the poll. If you answer yes to my first question, please raise your hand. A little exercise early in the morning for us. And then as long as you answer yes to each of the subsequent questions, there are three more, four minus one is three, keep your hand raised. Are you ready? Yeah. Oh, I need to hear it. Are you ready? Yeah. Yeah, all right, all right. <laughs> okay, you understand what we're doing here? Okay, here's the first question. Now watch this, I got this great little thing here. Oh, you see that? Stand up, he kind of jumped in there. Yes or no, a democratic political system is a very good or fairly good way of governing the United States. Raise your hand if you say yes. Okay, I'll do a quick up. Now keep them up, this is the hard part, keep them up. If you said no, you're out of the game. Uh, sorry about that. Good, let's go to question number two. Yes or no, democracy is preferable to any other kind of government. Keep your hand raised, lower it if you disagree. Okay, thank you for playing. Question number three, hope you're not getting tired. Army rule, army rule, watch this word, question is worded backwards. Army rule is fairly bad or very bad way of governing the United States, yes or no, okay? Fairly bad or very bad, okay? And finally, of those of you with your hands still up, a little early morning exercise, yes or no, having a strong leader who doesn't have to bother with Congress or elections is a fairly bad or very bad way of governing the United States. Watch, it's reverse order, dear. Okay, now let me do a quick count. Got to put on my glasses. Okay, keep those hands up there, please. Oh my God, all right, I've done that count. You can put your hands down now. Thank you for playing. I estimate that 84.7% of you, <laughs> by my very quick math, uh, answered yes to all four questions. Actually, you'll probably will be closer to 90. You're one of the highest audiences I've, I've been at. 
And if you answered yes to all four of these questions, you were considered a consistent supporter of democracy. Woohoo! So like 91% of us still believe in democracy. Yeah, a round of applause, because it's kind of important. Uh, now the question before the House, now I'm going to pick on you, is what percent of Americans 18 years of age and older, so voting age and older, do you think are consistent supporters of democracy according to a poll that I just came out of the field with for the German Marshall Fund? What percent are you going to pick up? Someone over here, just yell out a percent. 60. 60, okay, over here. 45. 45, whoa, price is right rules, remember, watch out. Hannah, what do you say? 43. 43, okay, we got 60, 45, 43. Anyone want to go higher? 76. 76, too bad you're out. Okay. <laughs> Hannah, because she's studying so well, is right on. The answer from a national survey, you're within the statistical margin of error, okay? It's 1,300 sample polls, so you're well within the margin of error. The answer is 41% of Americans are consistent supporters of democracy, meaning they answered yes to all four of the questions that I just gave to you. These are real questions. They're from the World Values Survey, Ipsos, Pew. And it's one other one that's in the battery. The battery has five questions on it. Here is the distribution of Americans uh, across the scale of consistency of support with democracy. So you can see that first bar, there's our 41%. Big, big bar. We got 43%. We are 90% here, so we are different than most Americans. And you can see these other bars. The 19% one means they answered one of the five questions inconsistently. The 14%, two of the five inconsistently. 17%, three of the five inconsistently, and so on. I can tell you the orange and red bars are not people who are ever going to have uh, supporting democracy. So less than a majority of Americans are consistent supporters of democracy. Here's the distribution of the rest of Americans. And it makes Franklin's question, can we keep our republic quite pertinent? Let's frame it. Can we keep our republic when less than half of Americans support democracy consistently? Well, that's my first piece of evidence. Let's move on. There's the 41%. See, Frank then, then saw it and he was kind of upset. Let's move to the second piece of evidence by digging a little bit deeper into the data and considering this correlated question. Is consistency of support for democracy consistent across age? In other words, excuse me, are younger and older Americans the same when it comes to consistency of support for democracy? Or is there a statistically significant variation? Because if there's variation by age, <coughs> this could be a uh, mitigating or aggravating factor when it comes to the probability of keeping our republic. Well, here's consistency of support for democracy mapped across six age cohorts. On the far left, 18 to 29 year olds. On the far right, 70 plus. I won't tell you which age cohort I fit into. Uh, and each bar represents the percent of Americans in the age cohort who are consistent supporters of democracy. Now let's add across the bars the average. And what's obvious here, the older someone is in America, the more likely they are to be consistent supporters of democracy. And this variation by age is statistically significant. To put a point on that, just 26% of 18 to 29 year old Americans are consistent supporters of democracy. Moreover, just 24% of 30 to 39 year old Americans are consistent supporters of democracy. And that was a real surprise in the data. To sharpen the demographic point a bit on the, yeah, the difference between 26 and 24 is nothing in statistics, but it's down there as well. To sharpen this demographic point a bit, I want to give you some qualitative information. So we did the survey, but we also did focus groups in uh, Wisconsin. And here's what the people we talked to, inconsistent supporters of democracy, had to say. First, we talked to black men. They say democracy is lies. The Constitution was never actually built for black people. It wasn't built for women either, and it wasn't built for other people of color. Another man said, more lies. A, a man said, democracy is a broken system that doesn't work. Broken personally as an African-American, the system is just not built for us. 
And then finally they said, democracy, democracy is finesse because it claims it's democracy, but in reality, it's not. Today I don't know what America is. These are inconsistent supporters of democracy, black men, 18 to 29 year olds. White men said, democracy is voting, but, and there's always a but, but I have to pick the lesser of two evils. Democracy is voting, but I think less and less people are relying on their vote, feeling that their vote even gets counted. Democracy is voting, but I saw the same ones. If your vote actually counted, they wouldn't let you. They wouldn't let you do it. So we went back and said, but is there anything good about democracy? This was to the white men, and they said, I don't think there is anything necessarily. I guess I'm kind of indifferent to democracy. And I don't think it really matters what type of government we have, what type of government it is. And even, I'm not, this is outside my presentation, but we say, okay, you really care about freedom. Could we have freedom without democracy? Sure. <laughs> Very disconcerting. White women say, democracy is government, but I don't feel, I don't necessarily care if it's democratic. <laughs> so, democracy is government, but I don't necessarily care if it's democratic. And the other woman says, democracy is people's voices being heard. I feel like there's a difference uh, between uh, having the freedom to speak and your voice being heard, even though we call ourselves our democracy, which I mean I don't think we are. Black women say democracy is, well, they tell us that we have these rights and that our vote matters or whatever, but it don't. Democracy is voting. What do we vote for? Like, I kind of felt like that was just wasting our time to make us, make us feel like we matter the whole time when we really do not. Democracy means like letting people make their own decisions. It's our choice, but I don't think we really have a democracy. And personally, I don't know what democracy means. These should be really unsettling quotes to you. They were to me. These are the voices in focus groups of 18 to 29 year old inconsistent supporters of democracy. They are white and black, not brown. They are representative of 74% or so of America. The second set of evidence, the data in these quotes, is what keeps me up at night. And when you think about it a bit, the future attitudinal landscape is likely to be even worse for democracy than the present, which is why my wife calls me the end of world speaker. What do I mean? Well, consider yet another question, which flows inescapably from the second piece of evidence. What about younger, Gen Z and Gen Alpha Americans. How consistent are they going to be when it comes to supporting democracy? I can't tell you what they are now, I haven't measured them. And also, anyone in the political science or history department or others will tell you, the psychology department will change, tell you these attitudes will change somewhat over time. But let's just think hypothetically for a second, okay? Given current events in recent history, is it more or less likely the support for democracy will be lower among these younger Americans, 12 to 18, than the 41% we're looking at. While I'm an optimist about most things, I'm pessimistic about this. And I predict that these Americans, when they reach voting age, will be less consistent supporters of democracy than the present national average. And if I am right, we are looking at the demographic ticking time bomb ticking away right now. And what is that time bomb, just to put a point on it for you? As younger Americans age, the overall average of support for democracy across the United States will continue to decline. And our time bomb is ticking down at a time when the American attitude and landscape is already challenging to democracy, freedom, and civil society. This is a real challenge. Okay, that's two pieces of evidence. I said I got three. I think I do. What completes my red flag concerns about the future of the Republic outside of the normal daily stuff we see in the news? Well, let me ask you another question. Which do you value more, A or B? Where A equals authority, obedience, and uniformity, and B equals freedom, independence, and diversity. Which would you choose, A or B? I'm not going to ask you to the vote again, because I didn't put my classes. But Americans, who are, how do Americans fit into this? Where are they, are they A or B? Well, 41% of Americans are more likely to be disposed to A. 41% of 
They are America's dispositional authoritarians. 18% or just less than half of them are highly disposed to authoritarianism. Another 23%, a little bit more than 50% of the 41, are just one step below them on the attitudinal scale. These American authoritarians are also more likely to, statistically more likely to, agree with limiting the freedoms of the press and media in the United States. In other words, they question the utility and need for a free press. They are more likely to agree, I often find myself fearful of other people, other races. They agree that increasing racial, religious, and ethnic diversity represents a threat to the security of the United States. They agree that sometimes other groups must be kept in their place. Very dangerous agreement. They agree it is more important to follow the will of the people today than the rule of law principles laid out in the U.S. Constitution. And they oppose the notion that all groups in America should have equal chance to succeed, or they feign neutrality in the issue. I don't know. All right, let's look at these together. Fear, threat, othering, inequality, will of people over rule of law, limiting the freedom of the press, that's quite a list. And that's where these, Ameri uh, these American authoritarians are more likely to agree with. You know, when fear or circumstance inflamed by the rhetorical misrepresentations of a would-be autocrat, online disinformation, fear-mongering, and other, activate Americans' authoritarian predisposition, many will rise to the siren call of the strong man. They will choose fear over freedom, division over unity, uniformity over diversity, and obedience over liberty. We've seen this before in history. This is not new to our country. As Eric Fromm noted over 80 years ago in his seminal work on political psychology, and academic Karen Stender argued just 25 years ago in her book, The Authoritarian Dynamic, which you should read if you haven't, when activated by fear, fear of other, fear of loss, fear of safety, fear of change, fear of all its many manifestations, we can all be really scared, right? Many authoritarians will choose to escape from freedom, freedom rather than defend it. In the face of fear, this is what quote from Eric Fromm's book, Escape from Freedom, freedom can become a burden too heavy for a man, it should be men and women, but it's just man, thank you Eric, something he tries to escape from. And it's in its most virulent expression, when the benefits of division and othering exceed those of unity, of people, and purpose, this process of group identification, aggression, othering, and protection can spiral out of control. That's what we saw on January 6th. Is this something new? Not really. Not really. It just, the expression of it was new, it was heightened, right? Since America's founding, there's been a perpetual tug of war between our aspirations toward a more perfect union and the authoritarian impulse that's a course to our policy and politics. Our nation's democratic egalitarian aspirations have always been rooted with a darker pathological tradition rooted in authority, obedience, and hegemonic enforcement of the norms. No clearer example of this to me, of this historical tug of war over America's future, are the attitudes towards slavery and blacks expressed by Chief Justice Roger Taney on the left, woohoo, great guy, and Abraham Lincoln. Chief Justice Roger Taney, carrying the authoritarian other end banner back in the 1800s, wrote in the Supreme Court decision Dred Scott versus Sanford that blacks are, quote, beings of inferior order, so far inferior they had no rights with which the white man was bound to respect. Abraham Lincoln, the Whig transformed into a Republican wrote, I am naturally anti-slavery. If slavery is not wrong, nothing is wrong. I cannot remember what I did not think and feel so. That underscores the difference between authoritarian and non-authoritarian. This tug of war between our egalitarian aspirations and authoritarian impulses courses through our history. And here it is on full display. I don't know if you can see this well. But if uh, I'll describe it to you, this is Madison Square Garden, New York City, February 20th, 1939. You can see George Washington up there, right? Right in the center. American flags. What you can also see, if you look closely, is Nazi iconography, merged into a full throttle celebration by the German American Bund in 1939 of Washington's birthday and American fascism. 
Now there's a great uh, short uh, video, Night at the Garden, you can watch, it's nine minutes long, it's really something. Often in our history, authoritarian overwhelms the better angels of our nature, producing the dirty laundry hidden at the bottom of our historical hamper, which is why we need to teach history. And it reveals our predilection, or the predilection of American authoritarians, to what Madison called the infection of violent passions. In Federalist 63, one of the 85 Federalist papers written in support of the Constitution, Madison warned about the infection of the violent passions and what it could do to our republic. He wrote, there are particular moments in public affairs when the people, stimulated by some irregular passion or some illicit advantage or misled by the artful misrepresentations of self-interested men, think about what's been going on, may call for measures which they themselves or afterward be the most ready to lament and condemn. Well, American history is littered with these Madisonian moments. Moments when our violent passions are activated by self-interested men and used by them to gain illicit advantage and kick our better angels to the curb. Think of the Sedition Act of 1798, kangaroo convictions and jailing a journalist like Thomas Cooper, who asked as he was jailed, quote, is my conviction a fair specimen of the freedom you expected to derive from the adoption of the federal constitution just a few years ago? How about the Treaty of New Echota? Thank you, Andrew Jackson, in 1835. You all know that, the forceful eviction and relocation of Cherokee from their land via what became known as the Trail of Tears. How about the driving out of the Chinese and Chinese Americans, not as well known, from the West, and the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, a bill Congressman Kasson of Iowa warned in 1882, sanctioned persecution, violated core American values, this is in the record of Congress, and transformed Congress into a pack of race-hunting hounds. How about Madisonian moments? The 4,742 documented Madisonian moments that occurred between 1882 and 1968, when black and other Americans were lynched and murdered. This led Mark Twain, excuse me for that, <laughs> Get some water. This led Mark Twain early on in this carnage to remain to rename the United States of America the United States of Lynchery. How about the rise of Father Coughlin, the radio lead of the Little Flower of analog anti-Semitism and Christian front nationalism pervade on broadcast radio? It heralded the rise of hate radio in the United States, and it's a precur precursor of the digital disinformation that buff buffets us today. Want some more Madisonian moments? Here are a few more, and I'll go through them quickly. The Palmer raid. Never heard of uh, Attorney General Palmer? He was worse than Bill Barnes. The internment of Jap Japanese Americans. You've all heard of that. The silence of the law and the ugly descent into racism, as described by Justice Frank Murphy in the Supreme Court case. McCarthyism, the House on American Committee, and the search for enemies within, which we have today, it's been revivified today. The search for comet pizza pedophiles to the mainstream of QAnon conspiracies. These Madisonian moments are not historical relics. They are here and now. In its latest report, the Southern Poverty Law Center counted 1,221 active hate and anti-government extremist groups. Nothing wrong with being anti-government, but being anti-government extremist group across the United States. Fewer than the high water mark in 2018, but in recovery mode, according to the Southern Poverty Law Center. And willing spear carriers of the politics of hate and fear. The menace to our republic and the democracy it protects is here and now. Here and now is a line from Aldous Huxley's book, Island. He talks about here and now, boys. It's here and now. Which leads me to one last bit of evidence, a fourth bonus point, if you will. In a small end discussion with 18 to 29 year old inconsistent supporters of democracy, a randomly selected national panel interviewed through asynchronous qualitative boards, sorry, last week. I asked, how do you feel about democracy in America? Which statement comes closest to your view? It's not usually good. Do quantitative, we use a little bit of quantitative to lead off the discussion. Well, 35% agreed they want to keep and improve democracy in the United States, even though it has its problems. 
But 55% didn't think democracy was possible or desirable anymore in the United States. And 18%, a third of those 55%, said they thought the government needs to be overthrown. The government needs to be overthrown. The good news is this is a small and statistically challenged sample. The bad news is it is yet another red flag that we are swimming in a riptide of historical proportions all in our lifetimes. And this riptide is amplified by the broadcast and digital media we all know so well, the media chambers, their fear-mongering, disinformation, conspiratorial mirages, alternative facts, other rhetorical othering about groups. This is creating a propaganda loop that's really unparalleled in history. Right? And it's aided and abetted by the fraying threadbare and out-of-date democratic norms and institutions that in theory exist to combat such forces, those that were set in the Constitution. So let me ask you again, is this something new? You know, yes and no. A disposition towards authoritarianism and the siren call of othering voice by the strong man has always been part of American history. Madison and the founders knew this. Our ancestors were not magically washed of authoritarianism or the predilection to it when they landed on these shores. And the paranoid style of politics is also well known and documented. I mean, it's identified by Richard Hofstadter more than 60 years ago as a fixture of American politics. Wonderful essay. But the crisis we're confronting today is greater in scope and more deeply rooted. Why? Because American authoritarians are activated in a way not seen in the past. The public support for democracy that we've seen in democratic institutions is at a nadir. Elites seek power and fear-mongering and abandoning civil discourse as a path to power. Digital media makes it easier to spread fear and disinformation than ever before. And there are eyeballs and profits to be made spreading alternative facts. And the question is, what will you do? Our republic, what will you do to keep it? Now, you might say the Ben's question, my dear friend, I don't know. I mean, I don't really care. I hate politics. I hear this over and over again. I hate politics. I don't care. And all I can say to you in this room is what would Paul Wellstone say to that one? <laughs> <laughs> I know what he would say. I've met him a few times. What did he say? Or you might think, hey, there's nothing I can do about it. It's a big country, a lot of stuff going on. I'm just going to live my life as I see fit. Don't worry, be happy. That was a great Pharrell song, I believe. Other, others of you might say, Matt, 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 we stopped being a democratic republic a long time ago. We're an oligarchy, a kleptocracy, run by special interests, for special interests, but I'm still free to do what I want, and that's all that matters. And to you I say, free riders have always been part of America. But that free pass you're counting on, riding on right now, might well expire in the next few years. And when it does, is the free riders of the Weimar Republic, Belarus, Russia, and a lot of other nations found, the results are quite unpleasant. Of course, many of you will say, because you had 90%, over 90%, who said they care about the democracy and consistent supporters of democracy, I do my part, I vote. To you I say, voting is a necessary condition for democracy, but by itself, it's not a sufficient condition to sustain it. We've been told by elites over and again, vote, 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 that's all you have to do. That will not protect democracy. That's a step towards it, it's not a, you must join the fray. You gotta fight for the future, call out disinformation, stand up for books, rights, freedoms, stand up for teaching of history, stand up for the protection defense of othering, those targets of othering, because they're everywhere. Centrality of truth and facts, social and political equality, and knowledge. Acknowledge that with every freedom we enjoy comes responsibility to each other, our communities, and our country. <clears throat> that is what your senator and Professor Paul Wellstone believed, and he was right. He was right. Now, some of you will never we say the Constitution was a lie from the beginning, written by a white property owners for white property owners. So who cares? There is nothing to keep. There is nothing to keep. I acknowledge that some of you in this audience have more right to that argument than I certainly do as a white property owner, white male property owner, uh, very privileged white male property owner. But your argument or excuse for an action ignores the full sweep of American history. The progress that's been made, 
Uh, and even though it's not been a straight line at all, we all know that, as well as the importance of America to democracy around the world. I travel around the world. I was just in Armenia. Before that, I was in Lviv, Ukraine. Uh, the importance of democracy to people around the world and America is, is critical. You overlook all the changes, improvement, and progress we've made, all the freedoms we've won, all the victories for the future through hard work, a real expansion since the Civil War uh, amendments, 13th, 14th, 15th amendments of the Constitution, of freedoms and rights that continue unabated except on voting rights until Dobbs last year, the Dobbs decision. While you keep, will you keep the Republic or be the first generation to participate in losing it is the question. Oh, yeah, oh, there you go. Certainly my generation has done a lot to pave the way for this loss. But the future now is really up to you. And let me be clear, the enemy is not other Americans. It's not. The enemy is polarization, division, fear mongers, and those who build their power, elites who build their power, and take that power by fomenting fear. You know, Justice Lewis Brandeis, wrote in a stinging Supreme Court dissent, written as a concurrence, Whitney versus California. Something that I think is probably one of the, the best pieces of writing in, in Supreme Court decisions ever. And he wrote, those who won our independence in 1776 believed that fear breeds repression, that repression breeds hate and that hate menaces stable government. Our stable government, our republic, is a menace. What will you do about it? I submit to you that the time to stand up and be counted is now. So I leave you with this question, what will you do? And I leave you with some beautiful sunflowers from Ukraine <laughs> to look at. So thank you very much uh, for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you very much.